Hi, my name is Jordan Mears. Uh, welcome everyone. This is the Climate Change Adaption Lightning Talks. Uh, as I said, my name is Jordan Mears. I've worked in geospatial technology myself for many years. It started a long time ago uh, in the US government. Uh, then I came to Google, helped build Tour Builder, worked on Earth Engine, uh, Google Earth Enterprise and Portable, if anyone remembers those products. Uh, and then I went on to help create the new Earth in version nine about five years ago. Uh, more recently, um, I've moved on to cloud networking. I'm not actually in geo anymore, but I like to come back to Earth every now and then and, and hang out with you all. So welcome everyone. Um, we are here for lightning talks. So before we get into it, I do want to talk about the structure and this is important both for the speakers and the audience. Um, first off, uh, these are our illustrious speakers. I hope all of them have showed up. We were a couple short a minute ago. Um, but basically the way the rules are going to go, you have five minutes to do your talk. We only have an hour, so we got to keep it moving. There are nine total speakers. And what we will do, I have a timekeeper right here in the middle. Thank you. Uh, speaker, when you have one minute left, she's going to wave a piece of paper at you to let you know that you need to finish up. And as soon as that minute is up, she's going to hold up another sign for the audience. And what I would like to hear is a big old grand round of applause as our way to give them the signal that they are done. Okay, so let's practice that real quick. All right, I'm talking for too long. There we go. That is perfect, that is perfect. Uh, don't forget to hoop and holler if you want to, so. Um, Cool, I mean, that is the gist of it. We do have a compressed schedule, very little time. There will be no questions for the speakers at the end of their talk. We'll move right into the next one. Um, however, since we have nine instead of 10, there might be a little bit of gap time at the end. I think I'll bring all the speakers back up and then maybe we can do a short Q&A uh, all at once if we have time. Otherwise, there is a networking session right after this where uh, the speakers will be sticking around to meet with you all, answer questions, that kind of thing. Uh, so that should be how the flow will go. Any questions? All right. So without further ado, let's introduce our first speaker, uh, Kishor Kautham, who is an assistant engineer at the Water Supply Board in Chennai, India, and also an active research scholar at the Institute of Remote Sensing at Anna University. Kishore is currently working on microclimate studies with special emphasis on disaster mitigation in urban and coastal cities for effective preparedness before any disaster. So Kishore, please come on up. Uh, and also, yeah, please applause, that sounds amazing. But before you do that, as I'm introing you, please just kind of file up this way to keep it moving. But thank you, Kishore, take it away. Today we are uh, good afternoon. Today we are going to see about flood maps. Floods are the most common type of disasters occurring throughout the globe every year repeatedly. The loss of flood are huge. Comparatively, the cities are getting more huge loss of flood compared to the rural areas. The floods map the uh, huge loss of life and property, thus leading to a lot of financial losses and economically stability. Economical stability is also getting affected due to these floods. And thus, flood mapping is much needed of the hover. Flood mapping has a potential significant importance in the effective preparedness and mapping and also for the assessment of the damages which are occurred due to these floods and how to overcome these floods and what are the causative agents that happens because of these floods. This is a simple workflow process which I have used in my study for analyzing the floods. Also, it looks like a bit uh, complicated. It's a, just a simple process of analyzing two types of satellite imageries. Basically, during a flood, we will be having a cloud cover and thus it is much necessary to use a micro imagery. And there are also a, at times when there will be a cloud cover reduced, that is after the flood, there will be less amount of cloud cover and that we have the options of a optical imageries. So my algorithm basically compares both the availability of the satellite imagery and use it in a best positive way to analyze the floods. This is just a sentinel imagery of the flood which has recently happened in the capital city of India in the July month and these are the just flood affected uh, flooded areas and here we will be having both the water bodies and the flooded areas and this image is the extracted images 
of only the flooded areas from the water bodies. The water, as you can see at the top, the water bodies are clearly removed and only the areas which are flooded are completely shown. And next, we will be having the, we have created a flood visualization app where we will be having the flooded areas, the water filled areas and only the flooded areas where we will remove the water body everything. Uh, this video will uh, show the complete swipe of the This video will be showing the how the flood area has been affected. This is a Bangalore city in India. You can see this is on a dry day and that is the only the flooded areas where you can see the water bodies are completely removed and only the areas which are flooded are clearly mapped. No, no, next slide. Huh. And after visualizing the floods, we need to analyze the floods and what are the impacts of this we need to clearly map. And we have created a flood analysis platform where we will be having the complete analysis of flood over each and every year will be linearly mapped into a multi-linear programming approach where the flood over a particular place in, a, uh, in different years are mapped and the uh, number of times the flood occur are, are given in the different class, that is the first time flood, second time flood and so on. Here we can import any types of uh, data over this uh, flood analysis platform. Like if you have a population data, we can overlay it on, on this platform and we can have a clear analysis of where are the areas which are having a greater impact of flood and then we can measure the distances where the areas have flooded and how much area has affected and what are the built up areas and what are the industrial areas and what are the farmlands we can clearly map. We can also import any other type of uh, earth engine catalog into this visualization uh, analyzer platform and we can uh, be able to clearly define the flooded areas and its impacts. Next, this is the final outcome of our results which we will be able to identify the flood zonation mapping, which is the flood risk mapping, and that will be having the severities of the flood, whether it is a moderate flood or a severe flood, and which will be able to ha happily and very easily map the areas of vulnerability and potential areas for improvement, and the areas which needed to be, where people need to be evacuated for effective mitigation and preparedness for any future type of floods we are going to face. Thank you. These are the uh, these are just the links and uh, code for the uh, above. The process uh, I don't want to explain. The code is available. You can just have it and look it over it. Thank you. One more round of applause. All right, next up, our second speaker is Louise Philippe Morais Martinexen. Philippe is part of the team at the Amazon Environmental Research Institute and the Map Biomas Project, which reveals the transformations in the Brazilian territory through science, making knowledge about land use accessible to seek conservation and combat changes in climate. Woo. So to develop this product, you use all the image Sentinel, which has the resolution of five days. So we identify the burning pixels in all the territories of Brazil, and we update this data for each month. So we have a big challenge to, to process the huge amount of data. So to overcome the challenges necessary to use the coding process and AI algorithms. Here's our workflow, basically we have a six steps, so the first of them is monthly create your mosaic using the minimum EBR index. So after that, you can create a potential burning area that will be very useful to your training samples that will be an input for our classification model. So after that, your evaluation of all the information that you produce and before sharing the data in a statistical with community. So in Google Earth Engine, we use all the images for available for the monthly to compose the monthly mosaic that it generates basically extracts the lowest value of the NBR index. This way you are able to extract the pixel that you were born during this time. So the next step is identify potentially burning areas. So to define the potential burning area for mapping, use all the hotspots available. So you create a 
five kilometers buffer around the hot, all the hot spots. It is used to reduce the process effort and minimize possible commission errors. So after that, you can export uh, the new mosaic to the Google Cloud. So we divide Brazil in 27 regions that you'll be very useful because of then you can collect the samples and burn it in no burned pixels. Uh, which are exported to Google Cloud Storage that will be used for to input data for our model classification. Uh, you use a deep learning neural networking. It is uh, capable for recognizing pattern of burned areas by replete training sample extracts for the monthly mosaic of the minimum BR index. So this classification method is based on collection one of map biomas file is article published in a remote sense. We use a toolkit to perform a visual analysis together with look at dashboards, especially to analyze all the information that you generated before shared this information with the community. So, uh, at Map Biomas, we always make all the information available for everyone to use. So, if you if everyone can visit your website, you can find the Fire Monitor platform. So, the Monitor platform. You can select the, the area that you are looking for. Uh, you select this example here, I'm looking for the Amazon biome. Also, the information is updated in the, on the fly. The next, you can select the year. You can select the, the interval that you are looking for the information, the month. And in the platform, you can find some statistics. For example, uh, burnt areas. The burnt areas per month, you can compare if for each year, and the time, uh, the type of use late COVID more affected by the fire. Uh, another statistic that is useful is multiple territories. So if you change the information about the region of the uh, the statistic is uploaded at the same moment. Uh, we create monthly reports too, that be uh, uh, very useful if you check some highlights that you produce here using this, this information. It's available in your Map Biomas website too. Uh, we create a user toolkit to download. If you want to download all the information that you produce, it's not necessary to be a Google or Fiend Express. It just gives you our website, you link to the, to the, to the link. Uh, it's very easy to use, it's very friendly. You just click, you run, and select the region, the month that you are looking for the information, and export, download the raster and CVF files with the, all the calculated areas. So, but if you prefer, you have a public asset where the user can customize all the analysis that you want. So, thank you for your attention. If you have some questions, please let me know. I'll be have, very happy to answer you. And follow me in the social media too. If you have some information, you can send me exactly to me. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone's moving on time today. That's unusual. All right, our third speaker is Eric Jensen, a geospatial data scientist who specializes in the application of remote sensing and other geospatial data sets in resource management and decision making. Currently, he's a research scientist at the Desert Research Institute, where he helps support the climateengine.org app and API. Thank you. Okay, so just test this out a little bit. Okay. All right, um, today I'm gonna be presenting on applications of Climate Engine for analyzing ecological change and informing resource management and conservation actions. So Cl Climate Engine, if you wanna learn more about Climate Engine, I encourage you to attend either the architecture potluck session tomorrow, or we're going to have a demo booth out at the happy hour this evening. Um, but briefly, it's a set of tools built on top of Google Earth Engine um, that provides advanced processing and visualization of uh, over 80 data sets and provides that with uh, no code and low code tooling. And so having over 80 data sets makes Climate Engine a valuable tool for assessing complex processes like drought in support of resource management decisions. And this example from Northwestern Nevada in 2015 is a great example. During August of that year, the US Drought Monitor showed this area to be an extreme to exceptional drought. Now, the US Drought Monitor is a, a common data set and often the only drought data set resource managers will use. 
when we look at another data set uh, from GridMet Drought, the long-term drought blend, which is a data set we commonly use, we can see that it disagrees with, uh, with the US Drought Monitor and also provides finer scale information. And so what does this actually mean in terms of the ecosystems we're interested in? We can look at NDVI anomaly maps also in Climate Engine and see that the areas surrounding the agricultural region for the same time period in August of 2015 we're showing above average production. And so our task now is to streamline these advanced vegetation data sets and advanced drought metrics so that resource managers can better use them. And this is a catalyst for our work with the Bureau of Land Management where we're working with the headquarters office and the National Operations Center. And our three tasks are to unify various satellite-based vegetation data sets in a common tool, develop an automated reporting system for drought and satellite-based vegetation data sets for all BLM land units, and then to provide training so that staff can better use these data sets in their operations. And so in terms of adding vegetation data sets to Climate Engine, uh, we've had climate data, uh, or I'm sorry, vegetation data in Climate Engine for quite some time, including uh, vegetation indices from Landsat, Sentinel-2, and MODIS. But just in the last year, we've added evapotranspiration data, fractional vegetation cover data, and vegetation production data, which provide unique capabilities when used in Climate Engine. A great example is OpenET, which is a powerful data set that you've heard some about today and has its own tool. But uh, Climate Engine adds advanced capabilities on top of what's possible in OpenET. For example, we can con compare evapotranspiration from 2021 to 2020, here seeing that areas, uh, agricultural areas that typically receive flood irrigation and didn't have water in that spring to provide flood irrigation had lower ET in 2021. We can also intercompare between data sets that until recently it was pr difficult to intercompare between. RC Map and the Rangeland Analysis Platform both provide estimates of tree cover um, but until recently have not been available in a common tool, we can now compare these data sets side by side and allow resource managers to do the same to better understand model uncertainty. And then because we're put adding this vegetation data alongside climate data, we can evaluate sensitivity of vegetation to drought on the fly for any location. And here you can see just how closely vegetation production in blue correlates with some of these advanced drought metrics from GridMet, uh, providing another line of evidence for resource managers in drought management. And so we're really trying to streamline a lot of this information for resource managers and have developed a novel approach, an Earth Engine Python module that produces a pixel database. And so Earth Engine is not a pixel, is not a database platform, but this module takes any time series image collection and any land unit feature collection and stores each of those values in, hooray, it's working, um, in a pixel. So we run the spatial reductions ahead of time and store the time series values for each land unit in a single pixel. And so when I click a pixel, you'll see 863 values um, for this time series. And what that allows us to do is to rapidly uh, produce the holy grail of uh, resource for resource managers, PDF and PNG reports for all BLM land units and to really streamline this information for managers. So with that, on behalf of our entire team, I'd like to thank you and encourage you to check out Climate Engine for some of these uses. Thank you. All right, our uh, fourth speaker is Annie Taylor. As a PhD candidate at UC Berkeley, Annie is partnering with the Ama Mutsun Tribal Band of California Central Coast to study how innovative geospatial tools can be applied to indigenous culture, revitalizing and ecological, re cultural revitalization and ecological restoration. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm going to talk to you today about research I've been conducting with Alexi Sagona and his tribe, the Amamitsun Tribal Band. 
So in California, fire is a huge part of climate change adaptation. And as wildfires are becoming increasingly severe and frequent here, more land managers are using controlled burns like this one to reduce the risk of that wildfire. And indigenous communities throughout the state are really central to this effort because they have been practicing fire stewardship for millennia and also have a strong spiritual connection to these practices. So I'm gonna to talk to you today about the Amamuts and Tribal Bands efforts to restore their cultural fire and how we're using Earth Engine in that effort. This is a photo of two tribal members conducting a controlled burn in November 2020. And this kind of burn not only reduces the risk of wildfire, it's also helping California's fire adapted ecosystems to thrive. It's preventing shrubs from crowding out our endangered grasslands. And it's restoring this very important spiritual connection that the Amamutsun have to fire. So a brief background about my partners in this work. The Amamutsun Tribal Band and Land Trust work to steward the area in the map shown on the right, actually just south of us along California's central coast. Um, and the tribe founded the Land Trust almost a decade ago to fulfill their sacred responsibility to steward the lands and waters in this area. And as you all know in this room, often we need maps and imagery to do that stewardship and conservation work. And so that's where I came in roughly four years ago to support the Land Trust in doing that work. And a lot of our work involves cultural plants and cultural fire. I won't get to talk about all of it today, but I'm gonna focus in on some work we did to understand the role of fire in the tribe's homelands. And we used a mixed methods approach. We used interviews with tribal members to understand the goals and the practices of their cultural fire. Next, we went out to the site of that controlled burn that I showed you in the first photo to conduct a vegetation survey. And we were really interested in how culturally important plants and invasive plants were responding to that fire. And then finally, what I get to talk to you all today is that we used Earth Engine, of course, to study the severity of that fire and the changes over time. So first, I just have to say our site is super unique. It's really awesome. It's surrounded on both sides by adjacent sites with different fire histories. And these fire histories are very emblematic of California's management regimes for their grasslands. So in the north, we have an example of fire suppression. In the south, an example of fire suppression followed by wildfire. And in the middle, this exceedingly rare grassland that's been burned every two to three years by state parks since 1991. And we used Sentinel-2 imagery and Earth Engine to calculate the relativized burn ratio, which is the fire severity index that's really well suited for low biomass ecosystems like grasslands. And we see this super clear signal where the wildfire is burning at a much higher severity than the controlled burn. And this kind of quantification helps inform the tribe's stewardship decisions. Earth Engine also makes it really easy to track changes over time as these grasslands recover from these various types of fire or lack of fire. Um, so these, I'm showing you NBR, or normalized burn ratio curves from Sentinel-2 imagery. Um, and the three horizontal lines are showing you those three sites. The vertical bars are showing you the most recent fire events with the wildfire in red and the two most recent controlled burns in orange. And in this case, high values of MBR are gonna indicate healthier vegetation and low values might indicate unhealthy or burned vegetation. So we see again this very clear signal with a dip in NBR following each fire and a much more severe dip in the uh, health of that vegetation following the wildfire. And our next steps with this, we're really excited to track recovery, um, how long it takes for these grasslands to recover from these types of fire, and also um, tracking how that no fire site can indicate um, the encroachment of shrubs. We can see it staying healthy and greener longer into the late season here in California, which is indicating um, shrubs have sort of taken over that grassland in the absence of fire. So importantly, we found that imagery doesn't tell the whole story of this, of this landscape and this cultural practice, but together with community voices and visits out onto the land, remote sensing methods really do paint a more rich picture of the landscape and are supporting the stewardship decisions of the tribe. Um, this is that exact site that you've seen a couple times um, that's been burned repeatedly by the tribe and it's full of their native and culturally important plants. So we're very hopeful as we expand the work. Thanks so much. All right. Uh, next, our fifth speaker speakers are Matthew Hutchinson and Aaron Trochem. Uh, Matthew is a solution scientist at Wolpert with a history in the geospatial and satellite industries. Aaron is a research associate professor at the Alaska Center for Energy and Power at the University of Alaska Fairbanks where she works on energy needs in the Arctic. Ooh. 
Thank you. Okay. So just one slide. Oh. Yeah. Easy transition. Hi everyone. Uh, Aaron and I here are here to tell you a little bit about a project that we're involved with and the work that we're doing um, is interesting and important in itself, but it's actually more interesting because of the people we have involved. And it's super um, geo for goodish in the sense that we met last year and we have some very interesting stakeholders involved. We have the University of Alaska Fairbanks, uh, where Erin and her team are from. I'm from Woolpert. We'll talk a bit more about that. Um, and then more importantly, we have the federal government that we're working with and they're the sponsor of the work that we do. And most importantly, we have the people of Alaska uh, and the Alaska natives up there that we're doing this whole project in that context. So real quick, you'll see this double text mapping mission. What is that? Essentially, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers as part of the National Coastal Mapping Program f uh, and supported by Woolpert, we, we help execute that mission in terms of flying aerial photography, hyperspectral imagery, and especially LIDAR, uh, bathymetric LIDAR. So we are mapping the near waters and we turn that into a digital elevation model. And Erin and her team, along with staff at Woolpert, um, edit, process, improve, uh, improve the process of all that. And so what we're doing is adding a layer on top of that to where we are bringing that into the cloud and specifically bringing uh, the imagery and the DEM into Earth Engine so that uh, scientists and others can use it. And um, so it can be used to solve real problems um, in the communities of Alaska. Um, I was worried about running out of time. Um, so as part of that, you've got Wolpert doing the technical uh, part, the flight, the acquisition, and then Wolpert helping with the cloud architecture and engineering. But then you've also got um, the university who have relationships with the local community. In fact, we're going up there in a couple of weeks. Um, similar to the last talk, we're going to go and understand their problems firsthand, collect more data, plan for future collections and things like that. Um, there's various research, algorithm development, um, storytelling, understanding, uh, training, job enablement, all these wonderful things being done by the university as well as part of this whole program. And then, as I mentioned, the end goal then is to uh, take this data, which is currently published by NOAA. However, of course, you guys all know the, the benefits of having the data available with a couple of lines of code in the editor. Uh, and so that is what we're going to do um, uh, for the Army Corps. And it's very much in a research and development mode right now in a paid, uh, paid way. Uh, but with that success, um, we can then move it around further around the nation as well. So, Erin? Thanks, Hutch. Um, so yeah, so the, the purpose of this work is, like Hutch alluded to, is number one, to uh, allow more capacity development for this type of work in Alaska. So we have uh, most of our uh, Alaska Native communities are in one of two places. They're either on a river, they're on a coast, or they're on both at the same time. And so climate change is a reality for us. And uh, in working with the Army Corps and Willipard who collects the data, this is really key data that communities need for doing erosion control, for looking at flood mapping, um, for doing hazard mitigation. Uh, I, we get a lot of emails about where is this data. And so our role has been uh, to develop, like I mentioned, more capacity in Alaska to be able to put the data someplace that we can um, work more effectively with communities as well and develop education uh, um, documentation and also really think about what is the best way to present this data. And so uh, we have a challenge when we go and we actually get to start working with the communities um, that as geospatial scientists, it's really easy to walk in there with a map and is a map the best way to do it? And that's what we'll be um, learning about. Uh, so we're really rethinking about how do you take a lot of this really key critical data um, and truly make it accessible for people. And so that is what we're doing. Thank you. This has been a very well-prepared set of talks. 
All right. Our sixth speaker is Elliot Hahn, an analytics engineer at the Freshwater Trust, where he builds analytical tools to quantify the environmental and economic impacts of agricultural conservation practices. Thank you. So I'm gonna be talking about agricultural conservation actions. And before I do that, I just wanna start by stating that ag conservation actions are climate change adaptation. So these things like cover cropping, for example, high efficiency irrigation, uh, these are ways that uh, growers are building soil health, building more resilient food production systems uh, to, to you know, adapt to the changes of, uh, of a changing climate. So at the Freshwater Trust where I work, uh, we work with uh, funders and implementers of conservation to try to provide insight that will help put every dollar that goes into conservation in a place and a time when it will have the greatest impact possible. So every dollar spent gets, uh, gets spent and you know, creates maximum impact. Uh, we do that in a large part using geospatial data analysis. Uh, a lot of it's built on top of Google Earth Engine. Um, so you can think about kind of all of the, the climate and, uh, you know, environmental um, data that could go into understanding what the, the, uh, the benefits of conservation might be. Uh, so one of the, the biggest uh, benefits that we've seen from integrating Google Earth Engine is just a lot easier, more streamlined access to uh, a lot of these key data sets. So these are all data sets that, I guess with the exception of OpenET, uh, that have been available for quite a while, um, but accessing them was never super simple for any of you who have worked with these. Um, you know, it was a lot of uh, finding the website, downloading things, storing it, and uh, you know, uh, we've all dealt with all of these, these issues. So Earth Engine has really helped us streamline all these processes. Uh, crop data, for example, we, we look at historical crop rotations, uh, which has huge impacts on you know, things like soil erosion and, and water use. Uh, evapotranspiration from OpenET has been really powerful for us. Uh, this is kind of one piece of the, the puzzle for understanding how much water is being applied on any given agricultural field. Uh, and then imagery, we use various imagery sources uh, for things like segmentation, for finding field boundaries, uh, also for classification models, um, understanding what's going on on the landscape beyond just you know, land use or crop type. Uh, and then, you know, for indices like NDVI and NDWI, which also, you know, provide a lot of useful information around agriculture. Uh, and then soils, I put coming soon here. Uh, we use the USDA Sergo data set. Uh, this is not currently on Earth Engine, um, uh, but we're, we're hopeful that someday it will be, and, and that would be beneficial for us. Um, so thinking about kind of, you know, on a high level, what does one of these basin scale or watershed scale analyses look like? Uh, and kind of, you know, the, the overall goal here is to provide uh, kind of a roadmap for implementers so that uh, when they're planning this watershed scale, you know, large scale conservation program, they, they have kind of, you know, this map to follow. It's not just saying we're going to knock on random farmers' doors and say, you know, can we plant a cover crop on your field and see how that goes. It's telling them these are the most impactful projects across the landscape and, uh, and kind of helping guide that recruitment and, uh, and you know, outreach to folks in the community. So doing this, if you think about it just in, in terms of an individual field, so in each of these maps, you can think you know, there's probably a, a few hundred agricultural fields in there represented by each of these polygons. Uh, you know, there's something, something happening on each of those fields, some crop rotation that's being, uh, you know, being grown, uh, some type of irrigation system. Maybe they are growing a cover crop right now, or maybe they're not a lot of different variables that, that determine uh, the, the environmental impacts of that, of production on that field currently and determine what can happen, what are, what are the feasible changes to that field. Uh, so if you look at any, any given field, you need to understand all those things to begin with. So this is where all these classification models uh, and different you know, environmental things like runoff models come into play. You can look at those on every individual field, but then with the power of Earth Engine and kind of you know, integrating all of this uh, into this workflow, we can do that across all of these fields in the entire basin all very quickly, um, which is something that we just couldn't do uh, a few years ago. So um, that kind of baseline assessment, giving us the understanding of what's happening currently, is what then allows us to determine, like I said, the feasibility of 
uh, things like implementing a cover, planting a cover crop uh, on, on any, any given field. And so with that information on each field, we can estimate uh, what the cost of implementing that action would be and what the benefits of that action would be. So we, ha we start with kind of almost nothing in a basin, right? And with all this information, we can then produce what is essentially uh, this roadmap for, for landowners to, uh, sorry, for implementers to go out there and recruit landowners. So uh, I'd love to talk about this more with folks um, if you're interested. So thank you for your time. Uh, thanks. Thank All right. Our seventh speaker is Rebecca Wilson, a data scientist ma science manager at Farmers Business Network, where she uses data and technology to help farmers make informed decisions and increase profits. Hi. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about how we use Earth Engine at Farmers Business Network, or FBN, to scale regenerative ag supply chain programs. Um, so a little bit of background on FBN is that we are a farmer to farmer network that was developed in 2014, uh, really on a foundation of data and transparency. And since then we've added a lot of different services and products for farmers, uh, including an e-commerce platform and a suite of financial products. Um, specific, and the goal of all of these is to help farmers um, increase their profits um, using data and technology. And so specifically, the um, product I'll focus on today is our software that connects farmers to grain buyers um, on a digital platform to enable buying and selling of grain and getting tickets, um, getting payments all on a, you know, in an app. Uh, it used to be you would call up to sell your grain and um, like get a check in the mail. So moving that into a digital framework um, and then the next step in that is that we can actually quantify environmental impacts for specific bushels. Um, and then that allows uh, those farmers to get paid a premium for doing specific practices. Um, so some of the practices that we would um, incentivize are, um, as just mentioned in the previous presentation, cover crops, um, reducing tillage, reducing fertilizer application. Uh, depending on the end market that that grain would go into would determine the type of um, attributes or modeling that we would do um, on that grain. Um, so the, uh, the end result here is that um, the grain buyer gets to sell a, a product with um, a differentiated product into end markets and then the farmer gets paid extra money for basically the data collection and then doing additional practices. Um, and so a couple of examples of uh, different um, end markets would be uh, low, low carbon fuel markets. And so in that case, we'd be measuring carbon intensity for that farm. Another example for food companies, they may be interested in specific biodiversity or water quality metrics that might help them meet their ESG targets. Uh, so quite a variety of programs that we work with. Um, and then on a high level, um, our data pipeline, of course, starts with the farmer. So we synthesize data uh, that's coming from the farmer, uh, which typically survey data or machine data from uh, their um, combines and planter data. Um, and then we uh, get field boundaries as well. And I guess a quick note on the machine data is that uh, we do get a lot of precision data, but there's still a lot of small farmers that don't have any of that sort of equipment. And so we could be getting things like paper maps um, or invoices is a way to get data. And so we've built everything to not uh, exclude farmers that don't have that, the high technology of some of the larger operations today. And then um, with all of the field boundaries we collect is where Earth Engine comes in. Um, and so we use that as our geospatial platform uh, to uh, assign field level attributes to every field that we collect. Um, so that would be things like land use change, um, irrigation, um, uh, crop rotation history, things like that. Uh, we do use a lot of the um, uh, features available in the data catalog. Um, and then we also develop our own internal layers as well, which I'll talk about a little bit more. And then the two outcomes from those, uh, uh, from the geospatial attributes 
will go into, um, most of those go into environmental models, uh, as well as um, using that to QC the data that we collect from farmers. Um, and then quick note on the models. So these would not be anything that we're developing in-house. We would rely on publicly available open source models. This would be things like greenhouse gas emissions, uh, biodiversity, and water quality. Um, and then we do like to partner with um, NGOs and government agencies to help them um, apply models in the real world and then pro you know, develop a protocol on how to um, use those in programs like this. Um, and then real quick, like I mentioned, we also use Earth Engine to develop our own models on agronomic practices. Um, so kind of a three-step process. Uh, the first step would build. Um, our FBN network data is usually is voluntarily contributed by farmers um, for the transparency aspects. And so that's typically what we would build on and then validate on our sustainability program data, which is a completely independent data set. And then finally test uh, with um, doing actual field visits uh, or other uh, data collection mechanisms. And then finally, um, before I get clapped off the stage here, uh, these are some of the uh, features that we've been working on in-house, and so really excited to hear about uh, work going on uh, with everyone else in these areas. So thank you. Thank you. All right. So our eighth speaker is Lewin Wayne, uh, or Lewin Wan, a postdoctorate fellow with the Stanford Institute for Human-Centered Artificial Intelligence and the Department of Earth System Science. Her postdoctoral research focuses on developing tools for tracking the North American beaver and evaluating beavers as a tool for fostering sustainable waterways. But today she'll be talking about her PhD research that focuses on nutrient transport modeling across the Great Lakes Basin and agricultural tile drainage mapping across the U.S. Midwest region. Thank you. Uh, so this work, as introduced, uh, was one piece of my PhD dissertation and was inspired by the important role of tile drainage um, in nutrient transport across the Great Lakes Basin. But um, currently, there is lack of uh, spatially explicit tile drainage data in this region or across large scales. I'm sorry. So first of all, I would like to introduce what's tail drainage and why I studied U.S. Midwest. Tail drainage is a um, form of agriculture water management. So uh, when fields get a lot of rainwater, uh, rainfall, wa rainfall, and farmers use this practice to remove excess water from their fields so that crop roots have uh, enough space to get uh, oxy uh, oxygen or nutrients or everything they need to grow. So the purpose here is improve the crop yields in their in farmers' fields. And uh, uh, why I study the uh, U.S. Uh, Middle West, the figure here shows uh, the county level statistic from agri USDA National Agriculture Statistics Service. It's the percent of tile drainage area in each county in land area. The yellow here represents the higher percent, and uh, purple represents the lower percent. In this region, 14 states across U.S. Middle West, 22 percent of agricultural uh, land were tiled, and it accounts for 92 percent of agriculture. Uh, 92% of uh, tile drainage area in the whole United States in this region. But the, uh, these data are farmer um, self-reported self from farmers. So the problem here is that we still don't know where tile drainage is in the field. So that's why I'm using remote sensing and uh, um, machine, uh, machine learning to identify uh, agricultural tile drainage and also identify what are the important variables for this classification. And we started by collecting ground truth data, uh, including tail and non-tail points, which come from different sources. And one of them here is visual interpretation from uh, area 
aerial imagery based on Google's Pro and based on tile drainage features. So as here showing, the tile lines get dried faster after a rainfall event. So we identify those are the tile drainage lines. And second, we collected 31 variables from 11 satellite and environmental uh, data sets, including NANSET, uh, NANSET uh, derived NDVI and uh, NDWI soil moisture from SMAP and also uh, slope based on DEM. Uh, and then surface temperature based from MODIS uh, climate variables such as aridity and uh, ET from uh, granite and terry, cra uh, terry cl climate and soil property from Polarius. Uh, soil drainage classes from GSOGO and the distance to the nearest canals or ditches from an HD data set and the covenant, also the last one is uh, hydrological land landscape region. All of this data set can be accessed from the Google Earth Engine data log or the awesome uh, data set catalog. So uh, after getting this uh, tile drainage ground truth information and uh, variables, we ran uh, random forest machine learning in Google Earth Engine and with 500 trees plus seven variables per split. So this pro the, the reason why I use this combination is, it, is because it provides the highest accuracy for the classifier. And uh, a, a zoom in window showing here is a classified tile drainage map in the third box. So the tile drainage area classified as blue and cropland are yellow areas. The white areas are the um, uh, non-agricultural lines. So we can see that there are mostly uh, those tile permits from uh, North Dakota from the local government identified as uh, tile drainage in our classified map. And uh, the uh, accuracy level at Pixar and county level showing that our prediction model performs well. And we also look at the variable importance, especially look at mean decrease accuracy, mean decrease journey and the Sharply value um, and uh, using an overall importance measure here. And um, the last slide here, a uh, major takeaway is that there is no available data sets uh, looking at spatially explicit child drainage information. But here we show that remote sensing and machine learning provide the potential to map child drainage area across large, uh, uh, large spaces. And there are some future work, and believe my uh, our work provided the baseline for the future works. And if you are interested, my dissertation is available online, and the data sets will become public available soon. Thank you. All right, our ninth and final speaker is Tina Liu, uh, a NOAA Climate and Global Change Postdoctoral Fellow at UC Irvine. Tina's research interweaves atmospheric chemistry, remote sensing, GIS, statistical modeling, and public health in an effort to better understand the human and climate drivers and air quality and public health impacts of global fires with a special focus on India, equatorial Asia, and the Western United States. Okay, thank you. Um, so today I'll be presenting on some work we did in Google Earth Engine using GOES data to track large fire progression. So this is a pictorial view of our method and I actually got inspired uh, into doing this project based on a Google Earth Medium blog article from a couple years ago by the Google Crisis Response Team on mapping fires in Google Maps. So in this method, we've added a bunch of optimizations to their initial method. So essentially, we start off with the GOES geostationary images from GOES East and GOES West, which is shown in step one there. And we converted the data quality flags into a confidence value from zero to one. The darker purple colors show high confidence, and the areas around the edges show low confidence. And this is just an example for the Creek Fire in California in 2020. Um, because these two satellites have different uh, spatial footprints due to their location relative to the fire, we can combine their spatial footprints into a downscaled resolution 
Um, the disadvantage of GOES is that it has lower spatial resolution relative to MODAS and VIRS, but it has much higher temporal resolution. So we're able to map the progression of these fires at high temporal resolution at hourly intervals. And then in Google Earth Engine, we also uh, implemented a parallax uh, correction based on the terrain. Um, and we also did some other adjustments and optimizations for our method so that our final footprint for the fire will better match with the ground truth validation perimeters. So in steps two to four, we uh, implemented these optimizations to the fire um, perimeter. And then finally, in step five, we output the polygon for the uh, perimeter. And for these fires, um, you can uh, get these perimeters for every hour after ignition. So you just have this stack of ghost images as you go on in the fire's lifetime. And we also compared our method with a VIRS-based method. So VIRS is a sensor that's every 12 hours. So when uh, a fire is spreading very rapidly, you get these large gaps. And with the GOES method, we're able to fill in these gaps when the fire is spreading most rapidly and when we care most about these fires and when they're most destructive. So on the left here, you can see that the ghost method is able to fill in these temporal gaps. And for the final fire perimeter, our method does pretty well compared to FRAP, which, which is from CAL FIRE. And this is a view of 10 large fires in California in 2020, showing individual hourly perimeters through time and space. So the cooler colors are earlier on in the fire's lifetime and the redder colors are later on in the fire's lifetime. So for each of these fires, we're able to map the hourly perimeters for these fires. And finally, we developed a Google uh, Earth Engine app where you're able to see these perimeters for each of these fires. And we mapped a total of 28 wildfires in California from 2019 to 2020. Um, uh, we also mapped the active fire line and also the, we calculated the fire spread rate as well. Um, and I also wanted to mention that this method can be applied to fires throughout the ghost domain, which covers North and South America, and also to other geostationary satellites like the Himawari satellite over Australia and East Asia. And one application for this data set is that we're able to estimate the stress on firefighting resources through time. So you can see in 2020, there were many uh, simultaneously burning wildfires at the same time. So you can see peaks when uh, the fires are putting on a lot of stress on firefighting resources. So this is ongoing work. We're trying to um, look at the structures damaged and destroyed as well. And we can combine our data set with other climate and uh, topography and fuel data as well. Um, and our data and, uh, is now publicly av available and you can see our methods in our paper in ESSD. Thank you.